Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh Welcome to my uh, online lecture Okay, so this is the recording for topic number 6 With the title of The Essence of Islamic War Ethics in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Sunnah After you have read this topic I hope that uh, you should be able to understand all four attitudes in Islamic or ethics rooted from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then I do hope that you could explain work ethics virtues according to the Islamic perspective. And last but not least, I hope that you could comprehend the inference of the essence of Islamic or ethics in the Sunnah. So when we talk about attitudes in Islamic work ethics from the Sunnah, it is clear that in Islam, work is not only important but also necessary. So this topic keen to discuss some attitudes which are fundamental to Islamic work ethics which derive from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam whether it is from his sayings or from his uh, examples okay so uh, as identified by scholars muslim scholars ethics scholars okay these attitudes are divided into four it is uh, the first one is uh, attitude to wealth followed by attitude to livelihood attitude to time and attitude to leisure and all these attitudes again i want to stress it here again that it is all based on what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had example us okay we move to the first attitude eh, which is attitude to wealth talking about attitude to wealth there are many attempts made by the disbelievers about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's belief and attitude to wealth for example the work of Bellamy eh, long long time ago in 1956 in one of in his dissertation eh, in, he infers that there are many contradictions in the hadith he said that there are many contradictions in the hadith about praising and condemning wealth and poverty so Bellamy discreetly mentions that some hadith seem to condemn wealth but some other are praising wealth. So firstly Bellamy thinks sorry Bellamy seems to think that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam blamed wealth at the period of Makkah but Rasulullah then changed his utterance by praising wealth at the time of Madinah period. So this view contradicts historical statements. There are many narrations that state that Rasulullah SAW blamed wealth after the war of Uhud. This statement was narrated by Bukhari who mentioned that the Prophet seems to disregard wealth after Uhud's war, after the victory of Uhud's war. Secondly, many companions strive hard to work in order to gain wealth. So Rasulullah SAW never stopped them from gaining wealth whether during the Makkah period or in Madinah period. So there is no doubt that the Prophet does not like the amassing of wealth or using it solely for one's enjoyment or for leading a luxurious life. No problem. Indeed, all Islamic legislations in matters of finance are geared towards a fair distribution of wealth. So there is nothing in the Hadith which can be construed as forbidding the ownership of much money or plainly being rich. No problem. Uh, if the companions uh, try to seek uh, money, try to seek uh, profits in their uh, business, there is no doubt that Rasulullah SAW has nothing, sorry, has no problem with this. Okay, it is up to the companions to get richer okay, because it is, it is not wrong. Some of the Prophet's companions were rich and we do not find any hadith which tells them to get rid of their wealth. No. So indeed, the, the uh, Rasulullah SAW 
received donations from uh, such people and his companions and Rasulullah thanked them for their generosity. For example, Sayyidina Usman and his wealth does not forbidding Sayyidina Usman from upholding the needs of Islam and Ummah. Sayyidina uh, Usman, we know that he has uh, several big businesses in his era. But in the same time, Sayyidina Usman had uh, donating uh, a lot of money, a lot of helps and assistance in terms of uh, wealthiness for the sake of Ummah, for the sake of Islam. And Rasulullah never uh, forbid Sayyidina Osman from having uh, this uh, search for wealth. Then we move on to the second attitude, which is attitude to livelihood. So there are plenty of hadith from early collections which praise work. In our previous uh, topic, eh, topic number 5, uh, about the importance of work in Islamic perspective, there are a lot of hadith which we have discussed. Okay, You can have a look into our previous topic. So, there are plenty of hadith which praise work. Many narrations established that the Prophet had asked Muslims to work. Miqdam ibn Ma'adi narrates, narrates, narrates eh, the tradition that says that the Prophet says, if someone goes out to seek nourishment for his small children, he is in the way of Allah. And he and if he works for his old father and mother, he is in the way of Allah. And if he works for himself for modesty, it is in the way of Allah. But if he works for the purpose of pride and boasting, menunjuk-nunjuk, belagak, sombong, so he is in the way of setan. Rasulullah SAW himself, who is considered a model of virtues in Islam, used to pray seeking God's refuge from laziness or idleness. Even before he was chosen as a messenger of God, he was a very hardworking person. And his uh, quality of uh, doing job, executing things, earned him the respect of his employer Khadija, who later proposed marriage to him. Because all of the merits and all the virtues sh she saw in him was so obvious. So in his instructions to Muslims on this aspect, Rasulullah SAW strikes a balance between the importance of worship, ibadah, and the importance and the needs of work. So in as much as Muslims have to be constant in their acts of worship, they also have to work hard to earn a living. So as it is recorded in one of the sayings, one of the hadith, one of the sayings of the scholars, okay, work hard for earning a living and survival as if you are going to die. The matter of gaining a livelihood is closely associated with wealth and poverty. So the following quotation impresses on one, uh, the rightness of working for oneself and avoiding dependence on the others. And also emphasizes especially the relationship between an activity in this world and its result in the hereafter. Fit dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. So Rasulullah SAW once said, Allah loves the servant who has an occupation. He said, Allah hates healthy servant who is unoccupied. And he said, He who gains his nourishment and does not beg from people, Allah will not punish him on the day of resurrection. And there is no one uh, more beloved of Allah. So, this saying shows that Allah hates one who is not occupied with activities of this world and leaving this world for the sake of hereafter uh, 100%. So, this is wrong. Okay, so it means that Allah really, Allah hates one who is not striving for himself to live, to earn money, to earn rezeki in this dunya. So in addition, the implication of the last traditions seems to be that it is just as bad as to neglect worldly activities as failing to work for the hereafter. So it means that we need to balance between the needs of our preparation for the life hereafter uh, by having 
the strives okay the hard working uh, to gain money to gain rezeki to gain salary okay to gain wealth for our lives uh, in this dunia the next attitude is attitude towards uh, time okay uh, the words are not appeared here sorry so attitude towards time okay in several hadith okay uh, rasulullah sallam as muslims to be aware of the value of time eh, because time is commodi- is a commodity which should be rightly invested. Rasulullah SAW says that the feet of Adam's son will not cross the path to paradise until he has been questioned and he has answered satisfactorily about his lifetime, how he spent it, about his youth, how he invested it, and about his wealth, how he earned it, and how he disposed of it. So this statement from the Messenger of God uh, mentioned the value, the critical value of time and its close contact to human working activities. So it means that the Prophet would like the Muslims to invest or use their time wisely and then forbid them, uh, Rasulullah forbid them to waste any part of it. The Muslim worker shall conscientiously and judiciously utilize all the working hours in dispensing all their duties and responsibilities. So the duties of Muslim workers must be as follows. Eh? This is in accordance to what Rasulullah SAW said, okay? what the companion had uh, shared with us and also what had been discussed and is debated by the Muslim scholars. Eh? So they should report to work promptly on time, uh, there must be an uh, element of diligence at work, never to play around or engage in vain conservation or in long telephone calls or WhatsApp or doing one's business at the cost of another employer or making excuses of leaving the work or leaving the workplace. Okay, So, the fact that ritual obligations eh, when we want to do uh, ibadah are to be performed at their assigned time or during a prescribed period. Teachers Muslim the habit of doing things promptly without delay. So when the time comes for us to perform our solah, we perform it at the earliest time that we can. When the time comes for us to recite Al-Quran, maybe uh, in uh, in between of the uh, lunch hour break. Okay, so we do it there. Not having our solat, not having our uh, what a recitation of Quran at the time where we need to spend to work. We need to spend the work with our friends. So the delay of the work just because we are having our time for reciting Al-Quran is not actually correct. Okay. Habitual delay leads to, uh, when we talk about uh, delay, okay, habitual delay leads to confusion and it causes losses and great harm. Eh? It is after all injustice to those involved. It is a violation of trust, a vice condemned by a mark of hypocrisy. Next, the attitude to leisure. So talking about attitude to leisure, the attitude to work and leisure exists in four different ways and they can be grouped as follows. Okay, remember these four different categories of attitude to work and leisure. Eh? The first one is A B. The second one is AD, the third one is CB, and the fourth one is CD. Let us look at the next slide first, okay? There you go. The first one is AB, the second one is AD, the third one is CB, and the last one is CD. Uh, if I can uh, simply uh, explain here, the first one, AB, it means that uh, attitude attitude toward uh, work uh, attitude towards work by a person is okay so it is a and at the same time his attitude towards leisure is also okay so it means that this is the first category a person with okay work and okay leisure a b the second one is a person with what we call as um a d he's good at work but he never care about his leisure time so this is AD, the second person. Uh, we can maybe reflect him by uh, what? Um, 
too hardworking, okay, or um, uh, not really like to have leisure time, okay, workaholic, alright, and then the third category is CB, not okay, KO, eh? KO with work, but uh, focusing more on leisure, uh, this is a problematic uh, worker, okay, and the last one is CD, not not good in work, and not uh, giving any importance on leisure. Uh, this is crazy, eh? CD. So let us have a look into the four categories of attitude to work and leisure. Alright, the first one, AB. Eh? So AB, work hard, play hard. Focusing on work, but in the same time, focusing on leisure also. So the idea that both work and leisure are desirable characteristics and that when no doubt properly disguised, should be highly enjoyable. So this kind of person, he know how to balance between his work and his uh, life. Okay, so work-life balance is there. Number two, AD. Uh, this is what we call as Puritan. Okay, so uh, the idea that work in all its form is good and on the contrary, leisure, okay, whichever cause that it takes is bad. Uh, so this kind of person is uh, too hardworking. Okay, maybe focusing too much on work, but he doesn't care about his leisure time, his family time, his quality time with uh, his wives and others. Okay, and then the third category is hedonist or idle rich. Uh, this is CB. Okay, so the category of CB is uh, this position is largely against all forms of work, mm. uh, hindering things related to work. Particularly if they are not immediately enjoyable or worthwhile. If the work is not really enjoyable in terms of maybe not enjoyable in terms of the burden of the work, uh, the, the relationship with the bosses and also uh, colleagues at the workplace or whatsoever. Eh? But they are in favor of leisure. Okay? They like to have uh, their focus on their life, eh? not the work. So this is called as hedonist. Terlalu... Suka berseronok seronok, okay. And then uh, the last category is CD. Ah, uh, this is what we call as alienated. Eh, people who are against work, pelik eh, and leisure dalam masa yang sama eh. Ah, uh, seem particularly alienated. Eh, maybe with concomitant feelings of powerlessness and meaninglessness. This kind of person, he or she might think that uh, there is no meaning of uh, working. And there is uh, no meaning of having leisure time in his life. So, ni gang alien lah maksudnya. Memang pelik lah. Okay. But it happened. Eh? We have all these four categories of uh, attitude towards work and leisure. A, B, A, D, C, B and C, D. So, clearly, Islamic work ethics, based on the Prophet tradition endorsed position A, B. Okay. Focusing on work. And focusing on leisure. So no doubt that Islamic work ethics would be against idle, self-indulgent and leisure. Okay. Indeed, many leisure pursuits, okay, uh, when we are trying to get leisure, okay, such as do it yourself, okay, we are having our time to bertukang, masa and so on kat rumah and then visiting relatives and fitness body programs, exercises, seem the very embodiment of Islamic work ethics. So, the concept of balance between leisure and also work is clearly mentioned by Rasulullah SAW. Okay, are uh, narrated by Ibn Hibban. The rational man, as long as his mind is healthy, should divide his time into four. Number one, time to link with their God. Number two, time to account of themselves. Number three, time to think about the creation of God. And the last one is time to fulfill their necessities such as eating and drinking okay so again we look into this attitude so a b means okay in work okay in leisure a d focusing more on work but leaving leisure out c b k o with work but uh, okay with leisure uh, ni hedonist lah eh? get golongan hedonist and the last one is the alienated persons C, D. K-O in work and K-O in leisure. But it happened. Eh? We have all these four categories of people. Okay. Now, we move on to the next sub-topic, which is 
Islamic Oetics and Motivation. So, motivation is part of work ethics, for sure. Eh? So, motivation can be defined as how behavior gets started. And then, how that behavior after get started is energized. Okay, dah bermula, diberikan kekuatan, energized. And then, the energized motivation, so the energized behavior is sustained. And then, um, maybe uh, we as the person who have that particular behavior, uh, after we have started, energized and sustained, how we direct it uh, to the proper channel. And then, at the same time, at, 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 at certain uh, time, we need to know how we want to stop that behavior. Okay? And what kind of subjective reaction is present in the organism while all this is going. Motivation is essentially uh, related with, number one, what energizes human behavior? Number two, what directs or channels such a behavior? And number three, how this behavior is maintained or sustained? Okay, for example, uh, at the workplace, you might find a person who is so uh, hardworking in terms of uh, cleaning uh, what the, the area of pantry, eh? the, the, the place where people shed, okay? Uh, there are foods there, okay, or to get uh, what uh, boiled water there. So there is a person who like to uh, clean that up eh, for the sake of his friend's usage. So what energizes human behavior? What directs uh, or channels such behavior? How this behavior is maintained? So we call it as it is related so much with motivation. So that particular person, what energizes him to clean up the pantry, might comes from. Uh, what? Uh, his happiness when he found that all his friends could use uh, all the apparatus, utensils in the uh, pantry nicely, okay, easily. And then, what directs or ch channels such a behavior? Because uh, he or she at his own uh, home, okay, uh, he did the same. He liked to uh, take a good care of things, kan? Eh? And then, how this behavior in maintain, is maintained or sustained. So, this is the responsibility of the manager or the leader. Okay, to maintain and sustain this good behavior by giving what we call as motivation lah. So, each of these three components represents an important factor in our understanding of working ethics. So, uh... Three major categories of individual differences in characteristics have been shown to affect uh, the motivational process, which is interest, attitudes, and also needs. Okay, so interest to have uh, some behavior at the workplace, macam tadi tu lah, eh? uh, like to clean up the the uh, pantry, and then attitudes. It might come from his attitude home. He bring it to the workplace, and also needs. Uh, he needs to have uh, a good environment, eh? a good uh, what uh, vibrance, positive vibrance at the workplace. So these are the th three uh, major categories of individual differences in characteristics. And then the Islamic motivational uh, theory considered two dimensions of human behavior. Okay, so the first dimension is the inner human body. Uh, which is concerned with the spirit or iman. And the second uh, dimension is the outer human body, which dealt with material needs such as physiological needs. Okay, so we have the spirit uh, or the inner part of our human body. The second part is the outer part, which is our physical or physiological needs. Rasulullah SAW says, Remember in your body, there is a lump of meat. If it is good, all the body become good. But if it is bad, all of human body becomes bad. Lo, it is hard. Eh? Narrated by Muslim. Okay, next. We move on to the next uh, subtopic, which is uh, work ethics virtues according to the Islamic perspective. So, what is VTU? Eh, as simple as uh, knowing that VTU is a pattern of thought and behavior based
based on high moral standards. Alright. According to one Nor Hasnya, okay. Islam's work ethics are founded based on two types of resources. Okay, there are primary resources referred to Al-Quran and As-Sunnah. And then the second type is, or the second source is, from the opinions put forth by Muslim priests or Fuqaha. So they could be accepted as guidelines and determiner, eh, penentu of work ethics, as long as they do not challenge the basic source of Al-Quran and As-Sunnah. And the aim of the Sharia which is to establish peace and harmony in society. So in the context of our ethics, uh, a sunnah source mainly functions uh, in defining and clarifying the rules advocated in the Al-Quran. And it also provides guidance in assisting leaders, assisting administrators and employees at the workplace in performing job functions that are that abide by religious expectations at what stated in Al Quran in Al Ahzab verse number two. So in determining the type of profession and work culture, the Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam propagated it either through his words eh, or through his action. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's statements. On work ethics were voiced through advice, voiced through statements or his warnings. Okay, so in delegating administration duties to his trusted aides, the main concern is to instill positive virtues while performing the task. For example, when Rasulullah SAW sent his envoy eh, Muaz bin Jabal to Yaman to defuse the ethnic conflict over there, so he was advised to do it amicably and patiently. On the relationship between employer and employee, Rasulullah SAW advocated to employers to compensate workers as soon as a job is completed. Terus bagi upah selepas satu kerja tu selesai. However, the amount of wage was not fixed as it relies on current circumstances. Okay, jumlah upah tu tidaklah tetap. Okay, you mesti uh, selaras dengan uh, faktor ataupun jumlah kerja yang dibuat oleh seseorang pekerja itulah. Rasulullah SAW's actions in instilling positive virtues in his administration and ruling practices were prevalent in the selection of governors, in the selection of military heads, and also in all his decision makings. Nampak jelas, eh? in every single uh, decision made by Rasulullah SAW, whether it is about the administration of military or governors and others, so it is uh, shown clearly, okay, by uh, his uh, good thoughts, okay, by his good virtues and so on. For problems that are not directly stated in the verse of Al Quran and Sunnah, Islam provides rulers and administrators of an organization with the discretion to employ the methods of ijtihad, like qiyas and others and others eh, in determining the concepts of work ethics. Okay, I jumped eh, from the next subtopic which is uh, types of work culture of Prophet's companions to inference from the essence of Islamic work ethics in Sunnah. I hope that uh, for that particular subtopic, eh, types of work culture of Prophet's companions too, you can read it by yourself eh, from page 45 uh, to page uh, 46. Eh? It's so short but uh, it is important but you can read it by yourself. Okay. So we move on to the last part in this particular topic, which is the inference from the essence of Islamic ethics in the Sunnah. Uh, lebih kurang macam kesimpulan lah. Kita nak buat satu inferensi daripada apa yang kita bincang secara ringkas tadi. Um, what can we uh, get eh, from uh, the essence of Islamic ethics shown by Rasulullah SAW in his uh, doings, in his words and so on. From all the discussion in this particular topic, it is clear that work ethics is a fragment of the Islamic faith 
and it has been emphasized by the Prophet Rasulullah SAW himself in many of his sayings. In view of the above, it is clear that the concept of work ethics is so much life eh, in the Islamic tradition and it has acted and still acting as a motivation in successes of the Muslim Ummah. Finally, the Islamic work ethics which widely exists in Sunnah could be briefly summarized with the following points. Number one, work is one of the highest forms of worship. Kerja itu adalah ibadah. Islam does not recognize any kind of unemployment, idleness, lazy. Okay, therefore, does not accept any doctrine of mutual reliance, tawakal. Eh, because the Prophet Rasulullah SAW opposed this doctrine by holding jobs. So, before we have our tawakal, we must strive for ourselves to make sure that we get uh, whatever we need to get in this worldly life. Kita kena berusaha, we need to be hardworking, we need to earn money. Eh, tawakal semata-mata uh, is opposed eh, by Rasulullah SAW himself. Okay? Number two, work is sacred. Eh, suci, eh, because it is seen as a duty to build a strong national economy. So, once work is not an end in, in, in itself, eh, but a means to destroy the non-economic dependent control over the economy. Therefore, work constitutes the first pillar in the construction of a healthy economic system. So, work, sorry, the, the, the uh, national economy is depending so much on uh, the, the effort of workers all over the nation. So, that's why we call it as work is sacred. Okay, because uh, it is the duty, a noble duty of every single person. Okay, maybe in Malaysia, every single Malaysians. To make sure that we could build strong national economy, we could give or we could sustain a good level of economy so that people will live uh, happily eh, in this country. Okay, number three, work must be done seriously. Once success in worldly affairs as well as in the hereafter relies upon how hard he works, how hard he do his ibadah, how hard he strives or be hardworking in his job, okay, so it must, uh, it, it, it will be reflected by what we call as the success of the work and uh, the life here, hereafter. The fourth one is, uh, okay, so the fourth one is the same with the, the, the first one, okay, work is one of the highest form of worship, okay, maybe this is a repetition, sorry, and then number five also the same, okay, sorry, okay, next. Uh, 6, 7, 8 here is uh, number 4, 5 and 6. Eh? Sorry for the mistakes. Okay, number 4. Eh? Not number 6 here. Number 4. Work must be done diligently and patiently. Without diligence, it is hard to achieve success in life. Patience is considered very important in a Muslim's life. So, these concepts require that Man possesses both traits in order to be successful in his work. Number seven, the relationship between man and God, man and nature and society, and even man and his soul seeks to bring all these into one path, eh, which leads to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So based on that, all works must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last one is, time is important in a Muslim's life. Thus, it should be used properly because a person will have to responsible for every seconds of his life in the hereafter. Okay. So, I think that's all. Alright. So, I hope that you will be benefited by what we have discussed in this a particular topic and insyaallah um, I am having my uh, midterm test okay sooner I will tell you the details later okay wallahu a'lam bisawab assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh thank you very much